Hey, hey, hey. Good morning, everybody. Oops, wrong thing. Good morning, everybody. That's a picture that I'm going to show you later. <laughs> hey, I uh, sorry that I'm a little bit late here. I just, just a second ago had this uh, remembrance of a, a part of this piece of scripture that we're going to read today that's super important. And I, um, I, 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 I can't believe I forgot it. I'm like frantically trying to write it down so I don't forget it in my notes. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, Susie. Susie was the first one in, and Susie's generally the first one in, so she must be an early riser. Good morning. Hey, Jesus is Lord Amanda Thrifty VG. Good morning, Michigan Daffodil. Hey, Krista. Magnifazio. Good morning. Della Peachy, Pepper Lee, Tyler Woods, Julie. Jeanette, Je- Grandma Ginger's far- Farm, on Louise, Scott, and Ruth, and Adele. I don't know if we've seen you. In- well, no, yeah, you've been around. Hey, Adele, and Julie James. Good morning. Okay, we are going to be reading out of the ESV version of the Bible. If you don't have one and you want to follow along, uh, you can open up another tab and go to Bible Gateway or any of the other Bible reading programs and uh, look up the ESV version of the Bible. And so we're going to be in um, chapter 3. Chapter 3. Here we go. And um, we're going to start in verse 1, chapter 3, and we're going to read the whole thing because it's not that long, and it's important to take into context. So here we go. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, The ninth hour, a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, and asked alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he hung, or while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, or astounded, sorry, astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One, asking for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and now and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets— that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, 
the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and from those who came from after him also proclaimed from these days, You are the sons of the prophets, and the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and, and in all your offspring shall the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to, to bless you, by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Okay. Now, as you may surmise, Brad's going to say, there's a lot here. <laughs> because there is a lot here. Um, so, here we go. Let's just start unpacking this. Now, let, let's, let's set the table here. First of all, keep in mind, this is shortly after. We don't know the time span between... Uh, the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost event of the tongues of fire and the interpretations of language. We don't know the time span between there. However, we know it must have been shortly after because the city is still filled with people, which that is an assumption. It is an assumption, but um, the city would have filled up with people when there were holy days and holy events. Um, so, that is an assumption you can take that part for however you like. But I didn't get very far out of this chapter before I started going, okay, time to start taking notes. Time to start taking notes. Verse 1. <laughs> now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer in the ninth hour. The very first thing that you got to notice here, and we talked about this yesterday, is that the old ways did not just get cut. There was not like a knife in that, oh, second chapter of Acts, Jesus has come, everything's like, chop it, everything that's Old Testament. It did not just disappear. It did not go away. It did not diminish. And here's another one of those evidences is that at the ninth hour of prayer, they were going to pray. Well, what they were doing was a very distinctly Jewish thing. And this is an interesting part of this. It's not actually commanded in the law to go up and pray, or to, to not even go up, but to pray at those specific times of the day. It was tradition. Now, why does that matter? Okay, so first of all, you've got these three times of the day that Jewish people were commonly praying at. They would go and pray at those specific times. Well, it's not in the law that it does not command them to do that um, at those times, but it became tradition. Well, why, once again, why is that important? Well, here's the deal. First of all, that Peter, I mean, think about it. You, as you go on through the New Testament, Peter argues heavily with Paul about the old ways versus the new ways. How much involvement should Gentiles have in the new church, in the new gospel? How much um, 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 of the Jewish ways should be imposed on Gentiles? And so you've got this mentality that, well, we're not going to stop being Jewish. We're just not, I mean, that's ridiculous. And then you've got Paul over here going, don't put any roadblocks in the way. Don't you understand? This is a big deal. And so this is one of those evidences that it, it did not just stop having a, um, uh, an impact in their lives, and it made a big difference. So um, the old ways, the, the ways of Judaism – were very real and they were not gone. They were not, it was not just erased, you know. So that is something you have to keep in mind. Here we go. Okay, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer in the ninth hour. And number two, 
And a man, lame for birth, from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple they called Beautiful. Now that's important, and we're going to get to that. That's really important, actually. So, um, but we're gonna we're gonna come back to that because it's not the best time to do it yet. Now, verse four. This is just one of those things that kind of gives insight into who the person is in this beggar. Uh, verse four. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them. This guy was so checked out, he wasn't even looking at the people that he was begging from. He's like, hey, give me money, give me money. And so I cannot imagine what kind of life this person must have had where they were just completely, completely checked out. But that's where Peter and John find him. Now, it moves on. Peter and John basically say, hey, look, you're looking for money. Nope. Got something much better. He's healed just because the Holy Spirit flows through them and does this miraculous work where um, he's healed. I have no silver or silver or gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. And raised him up immediately, and his feet and ankles were made strong, leaping, and uh, he stood and entered the temple. And here's here's the interesting thing that I think a lot of people will blow by with this. Don't forget that it was not too terribly long ago that Jesus was shellacked, ignited the f- the fury of the Pharisees and the Sadducees for doing what? healing the lame, allowing them into the circle, the circle of faith. Because in Jewish mentality, guys, if you were if you were lame, if you were born lame, if you were born lame, and it specifically says in verse 2, and a man lame from birth was being carried. If you were born lame, that meant that your mom and dad were horrific sinners, or you were born into sin even before you got to earth. You were riddled with something so bad that you deserved it. Now, now hear that. <laughs> the mentality was that either it was a generational sin where mom and dad were so horrible that they did something, or even grandpa and grandma, and it was passed down that you were born in that horrific state that you deserved it or you did something before you were even born um, even though you didn't deserve it. And obviously that's a wrong mentality, but that was a mentality. And why why is that important? Because they, they specifically mentioned lame from birth, number one. Number two, they took him into the temple. What happened when the last time... <laughs> Think back what happened when Jesus healed that, uh, was he a blind man? I think he was a blind man. And they brought him into the temple, and they're all fighting. They're all like, how did you do this? He's like, I don't know. The guy's like, this, the guy showed up, he healed me. Why are you railing me? Why are you going and gra-? They went and grabbed the mom and dad because they weren't satisfied with the answer. They thought, well, surely mom and dad were the sinners. And so we're going to go get mom and dad, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Isn't this crazy? So, but now this man born from birth, lame, is healed. Praise God. He's healed. Praise God. And uh, they have somewhat of a different reaction in the in the temple than when Jesus did the same thing in terms of healed. There's a person that was lame, healed, and then they were brought forth. Then what happens? So Peter starts laying into the crowd. He's preaching again, and he's basically starting to say the same message. We messed up. We were ba- we were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. We're the ones to blame. And he starts preaching. And he lays it out scripturally. He doesn't use opinion. He doesn't use conjecture. He is laying it out with scripture. Now, Verse 17, 
acted in ignorance. If you look there. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as also your rulers. Here's the thing. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I I don't know any person who actually physically sinned against Jesus. Just don't know anybody because we can't, but we are born sinners. Nobody has to teach a kid to go and sneak a cookie out of the cookie jar. And then when mom comes around and says, Hey, did you take a cookie out of the cookie jar? Not me. Nobody has to teach a child that it's born into us. We know it. Self-preservation. We know how to lie. We know how to steal until we're told it's wrong. It's not stealing in our minds. So here we go. Um, oh, I found this picture. It just this is a random side note thing. Um that uh a picture of when they said uh to, to, to where they were going up to pray. They talk about Solomon's portico in in a couple different areas. And here's a picture of Solomon's portico. Uh, that colonnade right there, that is, this is a, this is a, a model of the second temple, which would have been, um, accurate to the time. So those big pillars there, that would have been considered the portico, except we're not seeing the Eastern one. Um, we're seeing right there. It's right at the edge of the screen, but it's the same thing as the one you're seeing there. And, um, the reason why that was significant, why they kept mentioning it where it was, was because the prophet Zechariah, uh, I didn't write down the exact scripture, but the prophet Zechariah predicted that the Messiah would come through the eastern gate at the city, in the city, and coming to the temple. Um, and basically that portico would have been right there. So they want to be the first ones to meet the Messiah. They wanted, so that's why they were hanging out there. That's why second chapter of Acts happened there. That's why it was there. And that's why they were there again. So um, another thing here, just, uh, just a quick note, that in verse 12, they're just saying, hey, it's not us. It's not in our power. We are not like super beings. We did not achieve some massive faith. And and it says here, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? They're saying, it's not us. Now compare and contrast that to the faith preachers today that literally think that they can control this power of faith in order to make outcomes happen in their lives, whether it's money or boats or planes or getting the right house or getting the right ministry. And I, I, I got to tell you what, these people make my head explode because they always use a crutch. They're always like, well, we want to make this orphanage in Africa uh, the best doggone place in the world. And so they'll go and raise a ton of money using the crutch of an orphanage in Africa where generally very, very, very little, if at all, money actually goes there. Oh, well, we need a jet to get there. And, um, well, it's only me and my upper level staff that will use it. But, uh, yeah, we need, uh, you know, $40 million to make a building that would cost $50,000 to build here. Yeah. These people drive me nuts. And so when I see a scripture like this, I just love it because even Peter and John, these dudes hung out with Jesus. They watched it all happen. Peter, Peter, you remember him? No. Doubting Peter. Oh, no, he's not called Doubting Peter. He's Doubting Thomas. Uh, denying Peter? Well, he did that. But he's not known as that, is he? 
because it kept going. But he was there, John, Peter, the, they were they were on the inner circle. These guys, if anybody would have room to boast, if anybody had room to boast, it would have been these guys. But what's the first thing they do? They come out swinging with, it ain't us, it's Jesus. <laughs> I think that would be a good litmus test, too, guys. I think it would be a good litmus test for us when we when we think, you know, when we see somebody who's out there trying to do something for the Lord, if they're constantly kind of making things inward, like we are going to do this or I am going to do this or this community will do this, um, I'd be wary because it's the power of the Holy Spirit that does any of it. and We just happen to be blessed to be a part of it. And that's that's fact, Jack. So anyway, there it is. Devotion today. Um, I hope it's a blessing for you guys. Um, also, if you feel like it, go ahead and share share the. I feel kind of comfortable in saying share the uh, the devotion link with people. You know, maybe your Facebook friends or folks you know. You know, uh, I feel like maybe it's time that we kind of add a few folks to the coffers here. So, but that's just me. And I don't think it's anything I'm doing. I think it's Jesus. <laughs> that said, all right, let's move on into a time of prayer. I'm going to have to read comments later, guys. Let's see. What do we got here? Excuse me. All right. Cool. Cool. All right, Susie. Cool. Hopefully, she'll show up. What would her, her What would her name be, Susie? So if she does show up, I can I can say hi. Prayers, okay. Amanda Rollison for my brother and sister in law. Absolutely, we will most certainly pray. Ah, I survived the driving lesson. She's just having such a blast. If you guys don't know, I started having uh, Hope drive our little. Ford escape around for chores and stuff around the farm, not out on the streets. But uh, she's just having a blast. It's She lights up. All right, other prayer requests. What have we got here? Uh, let's see. Thanks for all your blessings. Thank you. Just thinking about sharing on Facebook today. Awesome. Restful and restorative weekend for us all. Amen. Prayers for Kay. Oh, Kay's the, the person. Okay. Just pray for us all. We will. Love for all. Pray for my son traveling back from Mexico to north or northern South Carolina. Yep. Oh, man, Scott. We are, that is headlong. Thank you, sir. I am escape. <laughs> Unspoken. Hope's escape. She doesn't have a, an escape. It's our escape. She was driving in the Ford escape on the property yeah Nova Scotia to be bypassed by Dorian prayers for comfort those who have uh, lost loved ones yeah prayers for everyone in the path of Dorian Colt for your home thank you prayers for us all Dorian's on the way I'll tell you what, though, Alicia and and folks that that live up in the path of that uh, storm, Krista and I have lived through many hurricanes in Florida. We've had category two go straight over the house, like straight over the house where the eye of the hurricane went right above us. And I want to tell you something. I've been through four four hurricanes, and um. The media wants to scare you. Yes, they should be taken seriously when they're when those hurricanes get up there in strength, but when they're down to like a level one in a in a tropical storm, it's just a really bad storm. The media wants to frighten you. Don't don't let it get in there. The worst thing that you need to be concerned about generally is flooding, um, but that's one of those things where you have an ability to get away. It's not going to sneak up on you. 
So just have a spirit of peace. Be prepared. Pay attention. But don't get freaked out. Think about it like this. The Weather Channel, this is like their Super Bowl. They're, they love when there's tragedy out there because everybody gets wigged out and freaked out and you just need to take a deep breath and go, okay, it's a storm coming. I can deal with this. It's a storm. And then prepare. So, all right, other prayers. Let's see if I, I probably missed a bunch. Um, fell on my board. Okay, prayer for that. Let's see. Prayers for those in the storm's path. Absolutely. People in the Bahamas, Hurricane Juan, yeah. Yeah, the Weather Channel needs clicks and views. Ain't that the same thing, man? Drama sells, you're right. I heard this was a level 5 Jean-Marie. You can check it out, but it is not a level 5 anywhere near anymore. Okay. All right, well, before we get praying, you know what? Here's the idea, guys. Are we given to a spirit of fear? No. No. We can submit our concerns to Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells among us now. We've just been reading it. These concerns of the world, yes, we should be prepared. No, we shouldn't stick our head in the sand and go, oh, la, 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 the water's rising. I guess somebody will come get me. No, but we don't need to live in a spirit of fear. We can rely on that peace that passes all understanding from Christ. So let's go ahead and jump on into a time of prayer. All right, Father God, we come before you today. And um, Lord, I, I would just ask, first of all, that you would embolden your people through the Holy Spirit, that they don't need to have undue anxiety and just buy into the fear mentality that so many people sell to try to make money off of people's emotions. Lord, that we would be wide-eyed and understand what's going on, but it would not permeate as a spirit of fear. You are the God that brings peace, and we trust in you and we love you. And we ask for that peace in our lives. Father God, for all the medical stuff going on, Tim falling off his skateboard and folks driving back from Mexico and traveling mercies and, oh, peace, restful weekend to get recharged so that we can come back and, and um, give it our all and be a reflection of you and that everyone would know, even by our day-to-day -day chores and work, that it's a reflection of you and that they would see your handiwork even in our day-to-day -day chores. Jesus, give us a safe weekend and um, help us to prepare if we need to prepare for possible uh, weather issues. Lord, be with those who have been affected by the storm. Send help. If we're that help, if we're supposed to be that help, give us the courage and ability to get there. And Jesus, help us to always rely on you. First, foremost, and always. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, guys. It's a weekend. We're coming back for more of Acts chapter 4. And I think you're going to find a lot of really cool stuff coming up. You're going to see things tie in in ways that I hope are going to be lifelong blessings. So with that, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you back on Monday.